Are we filming? Yes, we are. So, this is a review of my Lafax Bloomsbury. Let's have a look inside. Um, I really like the way Lafax used to emboss their binders. Look at that. Isn't that neat? Lafax, and then it says, if I can get it into focus, Bloomsbury, made in England. I like that. I like that. So, what's so special about this binder? And trust me, this is a special binder. I've taken some data. I've taken some data from some Lafax catalogues, courtesy of the Filofaxi website, uh, that has a very, very good resource for predominantly Filofax binders through the through the years, but also they have a few Lafax ones as well. So I have I've taken some of that data to to share with you today. Um, this is a this is a fabulous binder, and, and I just I, I'm going to avert it to the end, but I just want to get this clear, um, so that you know that perhaps I'm a little bi biased, perhaps. But this is a fabulous binder. But let's have a look at this. Um, this was introduced, or it certainly so I don't know when it was reduced, uh, but it was certainly in the 1985 catalogue. Now, if you will. Reflect on the date. So this was at uh, at the height of the of the Filofax style binder boom. And I I say Filofax in the same way as people uh, talk about uh, hoovering a house, even though Hoover is a trade name. They don't say vacuuming the house. They say hoovering the house. So when I when I say Filofax, um, I am specifically referring to the generic style of this binder that we all know, hopefully, love. Um, I just like opening and shutting this. It's a bit, uh, uh, it, it's a bit um, silly really, but it's just, it's just a nice thing. It's just, it's just got a nice feel to it. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so this is in the 1985 catalogue, so I don't know I, I can't find a catalogue earlier than that, um, certainly in the modern era, if you like. But uh, but it was in the 85 catalogue. It was also in a catalogue a, a couple of years later. Uh, but by by the, the third catalogue I looked at, which is the 1991 catalogue, this model had been dropped. So where do we place the Bloomsbury? The Bloomsbury binder in the range. Now, bear in mind, this was introduced uh, at the height, as I've said before, the height of the sort of the yuppie era, people carrying Filofaxes or Lafax binders, other manufacturers, other brands are available. Um, so this was a bit of a status symbol, I think. Um, if you look at the location of the Lafax stores in London at the time. There was one in Covent Garden. And if you go to Covent Garden today, the one thing you will notice is that Covent Garden is the location for some very, very high-end boutique labels. And I, my gut feeling is that Lafax was positioning themselves in the market at that top end where they had offices in Toronto and New York and Tokyo and London so uh, it, it it is it is interesting to 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 try and reflect and and place this in your mind at the height of this excitement this fevered excitement for what was a statement symbol you would carry it in your hands in fact interestingly the the actual the actual brochure itself 
talks about how how this is designed to fit in your hand. And I interpret that as this is designed to be carried in public so you can show people how posh you are because you have this high-end Lafax binder in your hand. You are showing it off. And people would show this off because this binder was the most expensive Lafax binder in the catalogue at the time, other than the Charterhouse model, which is a, a duplex model. And a duplex model, if you're, if you're unfamiliar with this, it opens like this, and you have a set of rings here, and you have another set of rings here, and then a similar flap of leather, typically leather here. So you would have, instead of two panels here, you would have a panel here, panel here, panel here, and another row of rings so that you could effectively have duplex operation. Um, and actually the chart house is a little bit longer than that because it was, it was, it was, I think it was four, I think it was four panels. Yes, it was four panels so that, um, Unlike some of the Farlafax models of the time that were duplex where the rings were here, I think it was a four I think it was a four panel design, but you'll have to you'll have to look it up. It's the Lafax Charter House. Um I wonder what the founder of Charter House back in the uh I believe the fourteenth century would have thought of uh, their name being used to to market a, a high end notebook, effectively. They would have seen it as a notebook, wouldn't they? With repositional pages. My goodness, kind sir. Um, I, I believe, yes, I just, I was just ch checking my notes. So this, this was in 1985, $150 American dollars. Um, by the way, any, any errors that you spot in what I'm telling you, feel free to, to leave uh, corrections in the comments. I hopefully I do try my best, but but occasionally I do get it wrong. And if that is the case, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna be doing, uh, as I referred to in my last podcast, is I'm going to be being more. I'm going to be more proactive in updating and correcting those errors in the in the comments below. Um, I've, I'll have a uh, chapters. I'm starting to do chapters so that you can you can uh, if you if you want to just get to the verdict of my review, uh, which some people inevitably will do because I ramble on too long, then you can quickly run along run along the the, the uh, chapters and then the verdict will be here. You know, um, but if you uh, if just bear in mind if you if you spot a, if you spot an error, then let me know and I will uh, I will amend it in the comments. So, 150 US dollars, 1985, and there was a there was a model that was identical to this in terms of uh, materials and construction, with the exception of you see this magnetic binder here. Now this attracted a, a twenty dollar premium because the Westminster version, which was the same as this but with a traditional strap like this. This is a Falafax vintage Winchester. So the, the 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 common strap and pen loop arrangement that we all that that we all uh, are familiar with, that is what a Lafax Westminster would look like. So imagine this this material, that style of binder. That was $130. So this represented the most expensive binder Arguably one of the top ends, the high end manufacturers of binders at the height of the the um, the popularity and the usage amongst the general population of binders like this. So this is a really really important model, if you think about it from that perspective. It it, it represents in terms of market placement a very very it has a very very important place in the history of these binders that certainly the facts they go back even 
they even predate Le, uh, Farlifax, the Farlifax brand, such as it was. Uh, Lefax goes all the way back to 1910. So a considerable amount of time. And the catalogue does indeed talk about the history. They play on the history. And why not? I mean, Farlifax do it as well, talking about the, uh, you know, the heritage the heritage of the, uh, the, the the brand, and they they use uh, they name some of the binders, such as the original, even though it's not original, and the heritage, even though it's kind of I mean it harks back to the day. But we'll talk about the file effects models on a later on a later video. This is all about the facts and this particular Bloomsbury binder. So it was. Available certainly by 1985. It had been dropped by 1991, not in the 1991 catalogue. And the price was $150. $150. Now, that doesn't sell much. But let me, uh, let me uh, indulge me with a little bit of maths. Now, I, I originally was faffing about, that's an English term, faffing about trying to do the exchange rate in 1995 and then do do a uh, consumer price index calculation to derive a figure f f in today's money in I'm recording this in October 2023 um, but I decided because the exchange rate varied so wildly back in 1985 86 um, I just thought do you know what what I'm going to do is just extrapolate that $150 because I'm because I'm I'm UK based. Uh, extrapolate that uh, $150 using the Bank of England's Consumer Price Index calculator, and that brought the price of this binder in today's money to $441. $441. Which, uh, at today's, I've just had a quick look before I started videoing this video. Uh, in today's in today's exchange rate, that works out at three hundred and sixty-two pounds. Now, whether you think that's a bargain or a shockingly high price, uh, that's obviously down to you. But we'll talk about price a little bit later. But I want to talk about construction materials now this is this is described as French goat skin let me show you this gusset now I'm not an expert leather but that looks pretty nice to me pretty nice to me it, I mean it just feels like a quality item so this was French goat skin but as you can see, made in England. Made in England. Um, and all these binders, interestingly, all these binders, I mean, the, the, uh, during this time, the uh, um, Lefax was just like the Farlefax brand. It was, uh, it was moved around, shall we say. Um, but this is, uh, this is a model... Uh, called the Bloomsbury, and the Bloomsbury Bloomsbury is an area of London that's quite posh, uh, as in Westminster. Um, you don't come across uh, binders. Uh, you don't get the the Lefax Peckham. Uh, apologies for people living in Peckham, but I've just used that because of the uh, the connotations with only fools and horses. Um, I'll probably get into trouble <laughs> with that because Peckham is uh, becoming very gentrified at the moment. Um, but uh, they all had posh London names. Uh, so this is the Lefax Bloomsbury in this particular case. French goatskin, English made. I don't know where. Uh, I don't know who made it, but, you know, it just... The, the actual quality of construction is really, really nice. Um, this was available. Now, I 
I am, my eyesight is not absolutely perfect from a, from a uh, colour perspective. Um, so I don't know. Do you know, I can't tell. I have trouble with, um, most of my, most of my colours I can discern okay. Uh, which was, uh, rather fortuitous in an early, an earlier career. But, um, I, uh, I find that I find it really, really difficult to discern a very, very dark navy with black. So you be the judge. I'm assuming, I'm assuming this is black, but it could be a very, very dark navy. I'll have to ask around, but you, you tell, you let me know in the pod comments whether you think this is, uh, black or navy um but anyway black and navy and burgundy and red and brown and i believe gray so six colors plenty to choose from and um they're all made of this french goat skin uh and it has this flap as you know this this magnetic magnetic flap which i'm not I mean, there's pros and cons, but I'll talk about the, the pros and cons of the magnetic flap later. Um, but let's have a look at this because I, I've been dying to, I've been dying to share with you the fact that this has Krauss rings. There we go. And I'm a big fan of Krauss rings, as you know. Um, I, I actually seek out, I seek out binders with Krauss rings because they are just fantastic. I never seem to have any trouble. I'm not going to go into the politics of the ring quality, but all I can say is these rings, these Krauss rings are consistently positive in use, very reliable. I've never ever come across any ring gaps and I've never come across any misalignment. They seem to be very, very nice indeed. And so they should be because they are actually quite expensive to buy uh, on the uh, wholesale market. So that obviously has to be reflected in the price. Pay the price takes your choice, as they say in the UK. Um, they're 25 millimeters internal diameter. There was also a 15 millimeter diameter also available um 25 millimeters that's pretty standard for a personal size binder as as we we all know um but what's the capacity of this well the official capacity listed in the handbook for a 25 millimeter internal ring dimension by the facts in their catalog uh, is 230 which roughly, roughly uh, equates to 70 GSM paper, 70 grams per square metre. Um, if you're interested in this sort of nerdy thing, um, typically if you were using bank paper, 50 grams per square metre, you would get in here a comfortable 304 I mean that sounds that sounds so specific. Let's call let's call it around three hundred. All I was doing is multiplying the uh, the actual. Um, uh, I was multiplying the actual doing the maths, and it comes out of three hundred and four. But uh, but it's it's three hundred three hundred for fifty GSM paper, and one hundred and fifty for one hundred GSM paper. Uh, I've got down here 70 GSM as 220, um, which is very similar to what Lefax quotes. But I suspect that Lefax are being a little bit over generous with their marketing uh, to give that slightly increased figure. But essentially, 70 grams per square meter paper, you're looking at um, nominally two, a capacity of 230, which is enough for most people. Not enough for some, but I quite like this ring rather than anything larger. Um, but it's horses for courses, isn't it? Um, this is actually um, this is actually a lovely thing. Um, the embossing, the embossing. I mean, I've, I've talked about the embossing, but I just think that's really, really nice. Um, but anyway, card slots. 
How many card slots do we have? Well, one, two, three, four, five. It looks like it's got five card slots, but interestingly, these card slots here, one, two, three, four, are they have just enough depth. There we go, my finger is at the bottom there. Just enough depth for a credit card. Perfect. With um, a little bit sticking out so you can so it doesn't completely disappear. But this one here, this is different. It's much, much deeper. And the reason for that is because this is described this is described as a pocket for visiting cards. So certainly in the 85 catalog, the 1985 catalog, this is described as a pocket for visiting cards. I didn't notice that before. I didn't realise that there was a difference between this pocket and these. So I'm going to be pedantic now, and every review I do, I'm actually going to actually investigate the depth of the pockets to see whether there are any differences in the future. So this one, four card slots, and... Uh, interesting, in 1986 catalogue describes uh, this as having five card slots and the 80, uh, sorry, the 1986 catalogue describes having five, The this this 1985 catalogue, four. I can't remember, I should have really looked closely and zoomed into the pictures. I wonder whether there really were just four on this one and five on the on the 1986 model or whether they just there's been just a a, a typo in the catalog who knows zip pocket now this is an interesting thing and in order to in order to demonstrate that i need some assistance so let's just know let's just open this so there's a basically a full length zip here and i just want to i just want to Hold this close to the microphone. Now, that is the sound of a super smooth YKK zip. Can you see that? YKK. So, a very expensive zip, re well, relative. To be honest, there's probably only a few pence between a YKK zip and a cheap generic zip. Um, but in this particular case, the facts have specified a YKK zip because presumably it gives the uh, gives the um, impression the right the correct impression that this is a quality product. Why why knock the product by by making a false economy and, and specifying a uh, a um, a zip that isn't smooth? And I just want to digress. I'm not going to tell you the manufacturer or the model, but. Someone did an unboxing video on YouTube um, a few days ago. And it's always exciting to do an unboxing video. I mean, I share that excitement. Uh, but it was, a it was a brand new binder. And when they opened the zip, the zip snagged. They had to, they, they had to manipulate it to get the zip open. And do you know what? That's not great. That's not a great look when you're doing an unboxing video and you find that the uh, you, you find that the zip is a bit a bit well. I personally I would have returned it um, for a replacement, but uh, this one, I mean, it's I don't know how much this zip has been used over the last nearly forty years, but it's super super smooth. But I wanted to, I want to talk about this design. Um, oh, before before we do that, let's have a look at this pocket. Isn't that a fantastic gusset? I've got to be careful what I say here and how I say it, but that is so useful. They describe this pocket in the catalogue as being suitable for holding a passport, and they do emphasise the security of having a zip. And, and we will talk about it a little bit later, but this inward-facing full-length pocket and the fact that you have this, they describe this as being able to be held in the hand. And it is a fairly secure item, although I'll talk more about security a little bit later. Um, but I would say that holds things fairly securely. And so I am uh, i don't really use pockets so much myself, but they can, I do appreciate they can be useful. And if, if you, if you, 
are into pockets on a file effects, then having a having a having a zipped one like this, it really really does aid getting things in and out because it's a little bit more difficult to get things out of this pocket, especially if you've got loads and loads of uh, inserts. I mean, can you imagine this? This was overstuffed, and then trying to get into this pocket, almost impossible. But this outward facing pocket with a zip solves that problem so long as the zip mechanism doesn't interfere with paper and i'm going to give you a demo in here because i'm i'm quite impressed with this so let's put a sheet of paper in now as it's open it's not going to affect the zip and you and i know you and i know that this is an important point when if the if the edge of the paper up here or down here if the zip is down here uh chews up the paper that's not a good look is it um and there are two ways around this one is to have a a shroud a leather shroud it doesn't have to be leather but this is a leather binder so if you had a shroud you would have a leather it's very very typical with some binders you have you the the the, um, the 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 actual zip mechanism is protected by a, le a, a flap of leather. Um, I don't have it on me at the moment, by, but my Philofax Sherwood I've had for thirty years, and it's my favourite one because of that. Uh, that does actually have a, a cover flap, but this doesn't. So is that an issue? Um, they've think, thought about this, but I'm just going to just close this. I'm going to close this. And I'm going to put the paper at the. I'm going to pull the paper out so it's as close as it can to touching the zip, and it it does if you if you pull it out like that. But if you if you step it out a bit, it's unlikely that you're going to have a single piece of paper here. And by the time you get to a whole stack of paper, it's not going to it's not going to actually. Let me, let me do this a little bit. Show this demo a little bit better by putting in a whole stack, if I can, a whole stack of paper. So, uh, all will be revealed shortly. Um, if I can, if I can get everything aligned. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a representative binder with a whole stack of paper fantastic right so let me just let me just show you this hard to tell on this so maybe I'll just I'll just do this so I've got it closed there we go I've got it closed and is it touching is it touching the zip mechanism I mean barely Barely. I think you'd be very, very unlucky to have problems with the zip mechanism. But they've obviously thought about this, and they've made this this panel slightly longer, so that more or less the the it's an op it's an optimal length to prevent the paper the sheets being damaged by the zip like that and so I think that that's probably deliberate I think they probably measured it and sat around the design table and worked it out and then why not good for them good for them let's take these out again and uh, apologize if you're wearing headphones when you're listening to this let me just shut that um, but it's a it's a nice it's a nice thing this this flap with the with the zip um it's um it's just a zip pocket but it's a really really it's really really nicely executed um let's talk about the pen loop because the pen loop isn't really a pen loop unless you're really lucky it's actually described in the catalogue as a as a loop for pencils and a quick test it does indeed fit absolutely perfectly a pencil 
So, it's not going to be great for you fountain pen users out there. Uh, although my Lamy fountain pen will indeed fit in here. Um, it's it's outbounds, and I prefer outbound to inbounds because that way it makes sure that it doesn't interfere with tabs, if you have tabs. And it's made of a single piece of leather. I won't bang on about it, but you know that a single piece of leather works for me simply because if you if you use a thinner piece of metal metal if you use a thinner piece of leather and just fold it over to give the illusion of a, a nice thick piece of leather then you will have problems putting your pen in or your pencil in there because there will be a lip inside um, where the hem is and you you might have trouble inserting your pen if it, if it is a snub nose design something that's pointy i know this won't go in but it's it's demonstrating a pointy end you'd probably be all right with that but in any event this is a not a pen loop it is a pencil loop and that is very very unusual because if you look at the pen loops for the filofax brands they are Almost every single one. I have had a, I have come across a couple that are narrower, but every single one, most of the time, that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, almost every almost every single binder I have that's a Filofax uh, has the same size pen loop, uh, and it fits their standard pen, and uh, it's a little bit loose for pencils. So this is a pencil loop, not a pen loop um let's have a look let's have a look at the um let's have a look at the the, the the whole concept of having the card slots on in the right here because i i really really prefer them on the right um because if you if you have let me put a few more in just to just to you know to be representative of what's going on. So let's say this is your this is your file of X and you want to make an entry. Doing it like this, absolutely fine, because you don't need anything to lean on because you're writing here. But if you want to turn over the page and start writing here, as you might well do, and you might well do on the first page of your file effects or the first few pages of your file effects, then the problem with doing that is with many binders is that you've got this problem with once you start loading up card slots with cards, then it's an it's very, very difficult to write on here and you have to find a piece of card or or something else to write on or indeed to take the the whole sheet out and then write on it and then reinsert it so notwithstanding the fact that you could fill this gusted pocket with quite a lot of stuff this is actually you can probably see that there is an imprint of the a small undulation due to the folded gusset there but this is this is largely okay to write on don't have a problem with that so for for writers amongst you um this is this is a good design because you're more likely to ha write on this page on the left rather than the uh, the last page on the right, um, simply because you're probably adding more pages before you you know like a diary for instance. It's you're less likely statistically to 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 write like write on the final page. Than the first page, so I don't know whether they thought about that when they stipulated that the, uh, the card slots should be on that side. But it's it's obviously something that's worth looking at. So we need to look at the condition here because this is a used item. I don't know how it's been used because I'm not the first owner. But let's first of all have a look at the flattability. Now, flattability will vary according to the age of a binder, as we know. 
we can have, for instance, say, um, a vintage... Uh, this is a vintage uh, Winchester, and some of my Winchesters have very good flattability. This this one has no flattability at all, because it probably needs, you know, many uh, many hours, possibly years of manipulation and wear before it will open flat. So I don't tend to use. I'm not going to be using this binder as a working tool simply because. Uh, the flattability is not there. But with this Lafax, it's absolutely perfect. And I I have a hunch that it was perfect from day one, simply because the way the panels are stitched together and the way that there is just a, a single piece of leather this way rounds behind the the mechanism plate uh, and the way and the way it's 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 almost like a hinge it's, it's almost like a hinge um, it lends itself the design lends itself to flattability perhaps more than other binders um, I I'm not a fan of bind I'm not a fan of binders where you have you need three hands one to hold it open, another to do your writing, and then another hand to operate the mouse on a keyboard or your mobile phone when you're on a train, etc. I would rather have, I regard this as a two-handed model. So you can you can have your phone in one hand and you can just, the, the binder stays open all by itself and then you can write. So great flattability. Um, external marks. There, there is, there are some external marks. There's one here, which is more like a bit of a gouge. It's very hard to see, but there we go. Um, almost like a sharp object has has just ripped the leather a little bit. And there's an indentation there. There's a mark here. So there's some signs of use. So you can see a bit more here. There we go. There we go. So there are some signs of use, but do you know what? Um, at this attrition rate, this will probably last at least a hundred years, certainly long after I've gone. So I'm quite happy with it. And a little bit of mark marking here and there doesn't doesn't really bother me. Um, ring marks. Now this is an interesting thing because this, unlike the, I'll, I'll use my Winchester again. So this has these protective flaps that are also flaps to to protect the things from coming out the pockets and there's another one here and these are these are commonly referred to as ring protectors but if you do have ring protectors this is my philosophy if you do have ring protectors these aren't replaceable they're part of the they're permanently stitched in so you can't replace them so after a few weeks or months you're going to get marks on the ring protectors it's inevitable so personally I'm not I don't really. I'm not interested in non-replaceable ring protectors. Uh, these marks are just part of part of life, and not having the ring protectors means that there's probably better flattability because you don't really need so much. Um, you don't really need ring protectors that just add unnecessary thickness. And of course, if you do have a ring protector, look at this. It's not a criticism, but it's just an observation. So let's just pretend this is a this is a page. You turn it over, and you're gonna you're going to feel this edge through the paper. So it's even worse than having card slots in a way. So you have to have something there, some sort of dashboard that is thick enough not to feel that. And you don't have that in the Lafax. It's it's just just nice and I, I again I don't know whether they they uh, deliberately thought about that but um, may I probably probably did I mean it's a well thought out binder um, the uh, the ring marks are something that uh, that I can live with and I I just see as part of the charm the rings themselves as I've already been discussing are perfect um, and uh you know i mean it's just i would say the condition 
the condition of this is not perfect because there are some there are some unsightly marks but do you know what uh i'm okay with that i'm okay with that um what are the pros of this what are the advantages of this binder compared to others in a in a generic sense well the first thing the biggest pro i suppose is the quality now i'm not saying this is the best binder ever made um i'm i think the uh, amiga my amiga runs it close where the quality the quality of construction and the use of materials and the workmanship again english made are absolutely superb um but it, it runs it close this is a very very high-end binder indeed i know that you can get some with exotic materials like snake skin or lizard skin or reindeer skin that's been uh reclaimed from a shipwreck that's 200 years old and you know and you can make them into a, a limited number of binders and sell them at a thousand pound and you know you know how it is so there are some exotics out there but i'll tell you what a combination of this French goatskin and the English workmanship of yesteryear. Uh, it really, really takes some beating. And you've got to remember this was made at the height of um, binder mania, as I call it. And, uh, and this might have been bought in the UK from their store in Covent Garden because don't forget that back in 1985 there wasn't much in the way of there certainly wasn't the internet um, other than for universities and scientists etc um, but not generally available to to uh, to to people like me um, so this is the pre-internet age and so people may almost certainly uh, would have gone to a store and bought this or or maybe an element of mail order perhaps so this would have been in the window this would have been in the window of their store in Covent Garden and again New York Toronto Tokyo and you know what a how excited Japanese enthusiasts are with this sort of thing um, you know and so this binder would have presumably i'm just i'm just uh, speculating here of course but presumably being the top of the range standard simplex binder i uh, one set of rings would have been in the middle of a window of a top end store certainly in london uh, they had two stores at the time one in one in camden and one in covent garden and Camden is pretty posh and funky, and I can understand why they had one there, um, especially because this is this was aimed at um, young, upwardly mobile professionals, etc. <laughs> the yuppie of the day. So this had to be appealing. It had to have the right look to be in that shop window, I'm sure. And so no expense was spared making this i mean i don't know whether they made a profit on the top of the range ones who knows um but the quality had to be top notch absolutely top notch and so that is that is really really the uh the big pro this the big advantage for this one because it is such good quality and so visually appealing and it and it just feels good in the hands um finally i would say a big advantage is the magnetic flap although it also it's also as a as a disadvantage but i'll get to that in a minute um if you look at if you look at this so these are similar age uh luckily the popper still exists on this file winchester which is quite rare a lot of a lot of uh, vintage file have lost this I've lost this plastic cover on the popper, so it's quite unsightly. This one not only has survived, but it hasn't yet started cracking. So, you know, I mean, it looks good, but you can you can easily see how 
this can be less appealing over time, especially if the leather strap is starting to fray and 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 become uh, less less uh, secure. Uh, there are an awful lot of uh, nasty looking straps with this type of securing mechanism but with this full length flap I mean it, it looks just as nice now as it did when it was made and nearly 40 years ago and to be honest this is probably going to look this good when my grandchildren are on their deathbeds God, that sounds awful, doesn't it? <laughs> what well, let me rephrase that. When 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 that let, let's just let's just call it a hundred years. Um let's call it a hundred years. Um so what are the cons? What are the disadvantages? Well obviously obviously and perhaps increasingly so, people that there, there are more, you know, it's not for vegans, is it? Goatskin leather, uh, to be a certain extent. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a vegan, but I am almost a vegetarian, almost. Uh, and I kind of sometimes think about, but the the goat in this case. Uh, I hope the goat had a, a good life somewhere in France. You know, um, is that a little bit sentimental? Well, who knows? But uh, but I I I hope that the goat uh, from which this leather is derived had a good life. I hope so. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not an expert. I don't know, but I hope so. I hope it was like a, a free range goat, you know. Um, so that's one of the disadvantages. It's not for, not for vegans. Um, another thing, I, you, you'll recall I just was talking about this magnetic strap. Well, let me show you this. So I've got it open and I'm not going to try and deliberately be slapstick for effect, but let me see if I can close it quickly. Right, I did it that time. Let's do it again. And I find myself sometimes having to look under to get it, to get it just right. So there is a bit of a faff when it comes to closing this potentially whereas on a traditional style binder well it's just easy isn't it in fact you don't even have to look I'm not looking and I can feel it finger and thumb and I'll shut it well I'm just going to close my eyes and do the same thing with this so I've got it open right so I'm gonna okay got it got it I can open my eyes now um but the that is that's a definite disadvantage i think it's 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 fine it's a good design but from a point of view of location it is a it is an uh it is an issue maybe not all the time but some of the time that would annoy me a little bit i think so uh i don't use this from day to day specifically because of this what I perceive as a problem with the flap. I don't use it this day to day. Um, I do use it, and I what I, I use it for reference and, and the reference material that's normally stored in here I've taken out just so that I can demonstrate this binder to you today. Um, from a point of view of being pedantic, there is something else. Um, you need slightly more desk space, desk real estate. Look at this Winchester, and um, if I line it up there, and then I move it over here, have I covered everything in the video? Yes, I can. So you can see that there's, between these two fingers, there's an enormous extra space requirement because of this flap. Um, and, and that might be an issue for you if you're on a train or a bus or or a cafe where you're trying to balance your your um pain du chocolat and your your latte and and there's there's limited space and it's a busy cafe you know there is more space required to open this out and you can't fold this over well you could but it's not it's not really 
it's not ideal. So a little bit more real estate. And finally, this pen loop. The fact that this is non-standard, or at least it's not designed for it's not designed for the sort of pen that most people would like to use in a binder, that may be a disadvantage. That may be a con. But I think we're splitting hairs here. Um Oh, just want to say one thing before I get to my verdict, because I forgot. These corners, they are absolutely lovely. They are made so well. And I don't like sharp corners because uh, they can, uh, they, they could potentially um, cause wear and tear on a, in, a, in the lining of a bag or a lining of a pocket. Um, and these are really well made really well made um it's one of the things that i don't like about my amiga um is although these are these are well made the way they're cinched up here i don't know what the technical term is they just look a little bit mm, they just look a little bit not not perfect you can see that i don't like that i mean they are better than for this is better these corners are better than virtually any other binder I own. But I'm a bit of a corner snob, I think. And these, uh, I think they, should, they could do better. They really could do better. I mean, they're nice. They're nice, but it's just not very... It's just not very neat. It's not very neat. But the ones on here... This Lefax Bloomsbury are superb. I can't. I mean, I I would I would say I couldn't do any better myself. I can't. I wouldn't be able to do them at all. But they are just so they're they're so nicely done. I'd love to know how they do that and make it so neat. And I'd like to see this sort of quality on other binders too. But I appreciate this is probably very very high end to have that sort of level of skill to do that. And, you know, uh, it, it, that, that sort of level of skill probably, probably costs quite a bit of money. Who knows? You get what you pay for these days. Um, so what is my, what is my verdict about this entire, there we go. I'm having trouble shutting it again. Um, what is my verdict? Well, it's certainly a product for its time. It was a product that was probably in the shop window in the Tokyo and uh, Toronto stores and uh, Paris and, and here in London and New York. Um, and so this is clearly an object of desire and it was marketed in that way. Um, I think I read s some of their literature talking about um, busy, busy professionals uh, making retail purchases in t first, first in Tokyo and then in London. Well, I've that's not me. <laughs> I I have never gone from making purchases in Tokyo to purchases in London. I mean, I mean, I live just outside London and I regularly go there, but I've never been. I've never been to Tokyo, so I am not. If I was, if I was transported back into uh, 1985, or indeed I, I I was working in 1985, would I have been Lafax's target audience in my jeans and trainers and Motley Crue t-shirt and orange hair, Mohican hair, and uh, and uh, DMs? Uh, probably not. In fact, if I'd gone into the store and and said, uh, "Show me a show me a Bloomsbury model, my good man," they'd go. Uh, sorry, sir. I think you are in the wrong shop. Good day. Um, but anyway, so I, I, I'm pontificating there. But I am. Um, I'm not their target audience. But this is definitely something that you could, you could hold and own. And if you did, back in the day, you would have been able to carry this with a certain swagger, knowing that not only you picked. You'd picked something of good taste, but also it was one of the most expensive. It was the top of the range of a very, very good 
uh, mark uh, manufacturer of brands. So it was certainly a product of its time, made from the finest materials by English craftsmen or women and constructed to last for maybe a, maybe a hundred years or more. Um, so if you can find one of these, if you can find one of these at the right price, the Lefax Bloomsbury is possibly one of the bargains of the century. Oh, I got it right that time. Thank you very much for watching my video. Until next time, goodbye.